uh, in general, historically, kind of grade three has been the break point for surgical risk. Um, you know, meaning on that scale from one to five, the five being the highest um, risk, you know, that's like, uh, those are very, very difficult lesions and often it's not worth the risk of surgery for what you're gonna do for the patient if it's an unruptured lesion. Um, grade three has historically been sort of the break point. But then again, not all grade threes are created equal. There are a number of different ways at arriving at a score of three, size one, uh, venous drainage one, eloquence one versus the size three, uh, venous zero, eloquence zero, right? Th those are inherently different lesions in terms of the amount of brain they span where they're located. Um, so not all grade threes are created equal. And so, uh, you know, having a more nuanced approach uh, can certainly be helpful. And um, as we think about these, that Lawton Young score, supplemental score becomes increasingly important because um, it helps to give us a sort of a finer gradation. And with that one, the threshold is a combined uh, Spetzler Lawton Young score of, um, of about six, right? And, um, uh, Lawton and, and his group have published a number of papers looking at, well, can we get around that number? Should, can we go higher in certain circumstances? And I think the, the answer is probably no. We really don't want to resect these very high risk lesions. It's just not worth it for the patient, right? And it takes years off the life of the surgeon. Let's be honest. Um, these can be hairy lesions for sure. Grade four and five, um, speaking of these higher grade lesions, um, these can be very difficult um, uh, in, in this series uh, from 2003, only 5% were completely resected. Partially treated um, lesions actually did much worse than if you left them alone. So 10% yearly hemorrhage rate, if you tried and didn't get the whole thing out, only 1% if you didn't even try, right? So often these are best left alone, you just observe them. Um, and they're potentially even lower risk than the smaller ones. You know, I, I mentioned the, uh, natural history studies showing, you know, two to 3% per year um, in general for AVNs, maybe the larger ones are actually lower risk at about 1%. Um, something to consider. There are some indications to treat and sometimes that um, these can be focused treatments, but if there are arterial aneurysms, things that you think are at high risk for bleeding, that's worth going after. If the patient has progressive neurologic deficits, things like a, a steel phenomenon or venous hypertension, that may push you to treat multiple hemorrhages, intractable headaches, uh, or other uh, fixed deficits that uh, that make it so that surgery isn't likely to hurt them as uh, isn't likely to change that as much, shall we say? Okay. Um, this is another paper from our group uh, looking at sort of a, a risk, say, a, a grading system for endovascular uh, consideration. So Spetzer Martin, uh, Lot and Young were all uh, conceived with a surgical mindset, um, but they're inherently different risks when you're going at this from an endovascular perspective. Um, so the group here uh, came up with a grading scheme, um, taking into account what really matters for the endovascular world. So number of pedicles, the more pedicles, the higher the grade. The diameter of those pedicles, as you might expect, the larger the pedicle, the, um, uh, the, the higher the grade. Now, dislocation, again, eloquence comes in here. Uh, that's perhaps not surprising because if you're gluing something shut, there's definitely a risk that you get some uh, uh, good tissue as well as the bad. Okay. Um, and, you know, kind of putting up, uh, you know, pictures with a thousand words when you're thinking about what these um, lesions look like for a low, intermediate, high grade, um, the endovascular ones are kind of look a little bit different than what we consider to be high risk surgically, right? Um, and that's because they're completely different um, uh, issues at play when with the different approaches. Um, I think this is a um, an interesting table, and I'll just point out this sort of middle column, the complications column. Um, which is looking at overall complications per rate or grade. And you can see this is, these are embolization outcomes for these patients. And when you use the Spetzer-Martin, sort of it's all over the place, right? So complications um, are high sort of from one to five. But when you consider sort of what's important for endovascular, you can see that low grade tends to have low um, complications, high grade tends to have high complications. And so that this grading scale, um, at least from a feasibility standpoint, it makes sense. These are the important things we need to consider. And if we're, tr if we're thinking we want to 
endovascularly treat a lesion that has a high endovascular grading score, maybe we ought to think twice or really make sure we have a solid indication there because you could very well hurt them. Um, so um, again, if or when to treat, rupture history is important. Has it already ruptured? Um, what is the risk? What are those, um, those micro and macrovascular um, features that we see that may help us to uh, understand the rupture risk going forward? Um, uh, and then age and comorbidities, life expectancy, if they're six and have a big, bad and ugly uh, AVM, it's very different than if they're 96 and have a big, bad and ugly AVM. And then the procedural risk. And again, it's combined, combined procedural risk because often we're doing multiple procedures on these folks over time uh, to treat them. Um, thinking about uh, embolization, let's dive in there um, as, uh, as an adjunctive approach first. Um, you don't necessarily need to, uh, to go for broke with these things. You need, uh, there's, there's risk with anything we do. And if you go for a big MCA vessel that's right on the surface and you know that you're going to be going for surgery, um, you're not buying anything, right? You can bipolar that on the way in very easily and eliminate the risk of embolization, gluing a catheter in place, having onyx go where you don't want it to go, you know, just by doing using your bipolar. What's much more uh, useful to the surgeon is to get the, the tough stuff, the stuff on the backside. So often you'll have feeders coming up from the ventricle and those can be very small vessels that are just gonna bleed like stink and you try to bipolar them and they chase, they run away from you. Those are the red devils that um, Lawton and others talk about. Well, if you glue that, you're doing the surgeon a huge favor and making the surgery a lot safer. Um, those are the ones that you that you generally want to target if you're thinking sort of surgically uh, as a surgical adjunct, right? Um, so, so very different set of things that you're looking for there. The way we do it here, um, and I think a lot of folks do similarly, um, at least some of these things, but we, we like to do our patients awake, okay, for most everything. And that carries with it pluses and minuses. The reason I, I like the awake patient is because you have immediate feedback uh, if what you're doing is causing problems. So you get into one of the pedicles that you think you wanna um, to glue shut. Um, you do the water test, infuse amytal or propofol, lidocaine, um, and then you test their function. Sir, tell me your name, how many fingers, uh, lift up your arms, see if they have pronator drift, whatever it might be. Um, you're actually able to query with some sensitivity what's going on with that little piece of brain that you have your catheter parked in. If you're reliant on neuromonitoring, you're much less sensitive. Yes, you may pick up gross changes, but uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be nearly as exquisitely sensitive as if they're awake and you're able to get the feedback. Likewise, if something bad happens, i.e. you rupture something, you tear something, you're putting a lot of strain on something, the awake patient's gonna tell you, right? They're, they're saying, ouch. And um, you know, hey, I better look at what I'm doing. Is that, am I causing more problems? Um, so, so we'll often do them awake and do that, that water test for each and every pedicle that we think we wanna take. Um, in terms of materials that we use, the, the two mainstays are um, glue and BCA, just expensive super glue. Um, and you can adjust uh, the rate at which that polymerizes by adding acetic acid to it um, back to your OCHEM days. Um, and the more acetic acid you add to it, the longer it takes to polymerize so you can get it to flow. So for instance, if your catheter is far from the nidus, you want it to take a longer time to uh, polymerize so it can travel further. If you're doing a fistula and trying to get it go through bony um, osseous channels, uh, then you want it to flow. And so, you know, that's, that's, that is something that you can vary sort of on the fly. There's a certain art to it. The other one that most folks use are going to be the, the new generation of liquid embolic. So things like onyx, squid, et cetera, uh, fill. Um, and these are non-adhesive. So it's not glue. It's not going to stick to the vessel. But what happens is you essentially have an organic uh, substrate uh, with an organic solvent. And as the blood washes out that organic solvent, the substrate um, just clumps, right? It precipitates. Um, and you have a bunch of uh, uh, material that's stuck in the vessel. Um, and that has certain advantages in terms of how you do it. It flows like lava, a little bit more control than the glue. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, quite good. We tend to take a staged approach. We'll do maybe up to 30% um, with, um, in, in a given setting, we'll do one or two pedicles per session, send the patient home, bring them back in six to eight weeks, uh, bring them back and, and do some more. 
Um, and that allows the hemodynamics to equilibrate over time. And we think reduces the rupture risk um, for, from the, that happens if you glue too much, but don't kill it all, all at once, okay? Goals of treatment. Um, this is important. You need to be clear uh, both with the patient and with yourself in terms of what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, cure from an embolization perspective is pretty rare. Um, so that's, that's usually not something that we're going in looking for. Much more common is having um, sort of this idea, hey, this ruptured, I need to find the rupture point and take care of that. So that it, was there an intranetal aneurysm or there, was there a branch feeding artery aneurysm? And my goal is I got to take care of that. If there are deep feeders that I need to take care of for surgery, I'm going to go for that. If this is radio surgery, do I need to try to reduce the size of the nidus and make this a more manageable target? Um, these are some of the things that we're going to be um, looking for. Okay. Um, so, um, so assessment of embolization, uh, this is a tough thing because uh, endovascular is of course uh, progressing quite rapidly. And I'll show you some, some cases later on you know, we're still, we're, we're pushing the envelope in terms of what we can do, how we're gonna do it, and what are the results that we can achieve. All right, we kind of have already talked about this. Uh, we're not gonna go into the embolic agents. So let's talk about that embo cure. Um, this is sort of an elusive thing. Um, there are certain groups in particular out of um, Europe, Turkey that um, uh, profess high rates of embo cure. In the US, we don't tend to see that, and I'm not, saying that they're liars and we're not, I don't think that's the case. I think the, the, the truth is um, in the US, we tend to have um, uh, a greater uh, willingness to go to the other modalities, radio surgery and open surgery. And we won't necessarily push the boundaries for the embo cure because the rates of complication can be rather high if you, if you go for broke and try to cure the thing, okay? Um, there are certain things that, uh, that tend to work best, uh, you, you know, lesion characteristics that uh, portend a higher rate of embo cure, smaller nidus, um, uh, fewer number of pedicles, and being able to get a flow-directed catheter all the way into the nidus. Okay. Um, uh, we won't go into the nitty-gritty of the actual um, embolic agents. Uh, suffice it to say that we've got a lot of um, different tools now in terms of uh, the catheters to get there and the embolic agent that we're going to use once we get there. Um, and the, the real, um, the real break point in terms of deciding which of these agents you want to use is how far it needs to flow. If you're far away from the nidus and you needed to go way far, then you need to use either some, um, uh, very, some low viscosity, uh, non-adhesive agent like an onyx, or use the glue that you've tampered with to uh, get it to flow with the acetic acid. Um, but most folks these days are using the onyx side of things and much less the, uh, the glue side of things. Um, and, and the other main tool that we need to think about when considering these is sort of the imagination, thinking outside of the box and thinking about how best to address the issue at hand, okay? Um, so we're going to skip some of this stuff and think about um, uh, the uh, about microsurgery a little bit. Um, so one of the real benefits of microsurgery is the fact that there is immediate protection, right? We talked about that risk of rehemorrhage after an initial hemorrhage event being about one percent per year or one percent per month. When you do surgery and you cut the whole thing out immediately, you've got zero percent risk of hemorrhage. Um, and that's that protective effect is worth something. Uh, compare that with the other uh, modalities, embo, embolization, of course, we're gonna be bringing the vac over months to do multiple rounds. Uh, and, and during that entire time, they have risk of hemorrhage and of course the additional procedural risks of each and every stage. Um, and then on the extreme, you have radio surgery where you're gonna be taking three to five years, three to five years to achieve uh, maximum efficacy. Um, and the obliteration rates there are maybe um, 85%, but it takes time and uh, you don't have that immediate protection. You also have potential to remove any life-threatening hematoma, the mass effect um, that can happen in the rupture and seizure control if, um, if this is uh, the nidus, uh, the, 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 the ictal um, lesion for seizures. Um, of course, there are risks associated with that. We've sort of talked about the characteristics that portend risk. Um, the, there's nothing new there. Um, 
So preoperative embolization uh, can be quite useful when you're going into this with a surgical standpoint. You definitely can reduce blood loss, um, cutting out some of the, um, the large feeding vessels and filling the nidus with glue can make it so it's a lot easier to deal with. Shortens the operative time and minimizes any hemodynamic changes. There is a, um, there is a phenomenon of breakthrough um, uh, perfusion hemorrhage that can you know, just vex the surgeon. You thought you got the whole thing out, patient goes to the ICU and all of a sudden they have a hemorrhage. So by um, changing the hemodynamics kind of slowly over time with the embolization first, um, you're able to minimize some of those hemodynamic changes going forward. Embolization does not necessarily interfere res with resection. Um, there are some, uh, the Michael Morgans of the world down in Australia, or at least he was, um, suggesting that it's not necessary um, and that it's just adding risk to the procedure. It doesn't necessarily interfere. And if you can um, take out some of those deep feeders, um, I think many will, will agree that it's, um, it's a useful adjunct. Uh, it can help to reduce the effective grade of the lesion. Um, and then there are these other benefits that we've kind of talked about. And, and certainly one of them that I'll say from having been in the OR with these is really helping to identify that surgical margin. You now have um, something intra-op that you can look at and point to and say, aha, this is a vessel that I know corresponds to this on the angiogram. And that puts me here and I need to go from, you know, do X, Y, or Z with that. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.